in this video we're going to analyze the opioid crisis. Keep watching. A judge in Oklahoma ordered pharmaceutical company Johnson & Johnson to pay $572 million for its role in the long-standing opioid crisis that has taken this country by storm and every day claims the lives of more than 130 people in the United States per day. The following day, OxyContin manufacturer Purdue Pharma agreed to pay $10 to $12 billion to settle thousands of opioid-related claims. There appears to be no end in sight to future potential opioid-related lawsuits across the country against the big pharmaceutical corporations. But are the big pharma companies the only parties to blame? The simple answer is no, and there are multiple other parties that mutually should be held accountable, from the drug maker, to the provider, to the individual patient, and lastly to the insurance company. Sure, the pharmaceutical company is the one providing the prescriber data that may be skewed in favor to encourage the provider to prescribe its strong drug or drugs. However, the provider in the end is the one prescribing the medication, and due diligence is needed. Just as in the case when the consumer takes everything a car salesman is pitching to him or her with a grain of salt, so should the doctor. The problem though is that the doctor is either too passive into doing more research due to his or her being tired and overworked, or he or she is focused on the secondary gain that can be attained from prescribing these opioids in the form of additional money or high physician ratings on social media, which leads to more business. There is a higher likelihood for individual patients to be more prone to go into a physician who is more likely to prescribe narcotics than one who doesn't prescribe narcotics for pain. Likewise, we live in an egocentric society to where everything in medicine seems solely patient-centered, and even though patients may not need a stronger medication for pain, a lot of times the want and demand is there. It seems that the conservative and prophylactic treatments that in theory appear to be effective in combating this crisis are in general the ones insurance companies do not favor. Insurance companies operate just as the pharmaceutical company and the physician a lot of times do, only thinking of the gross profits. Physical therapy, physiotherapy, rehabilitation, alternative medications requiring prioritizations, acupuncture, all formidable alternate treatments, yet costly in nature. Why else would an insurance company favor these more expensive types of pain management in lieu of simple, old-school, strong pharmacological agents? Furthermore, insurance companies are finding ways to maximize their margins by placing strict, hard-to-attain criteria with the goal of reimbursing physicians as minimally as possible. Just as with the farm company and the physician, for the insurance company, Money is more important than the patient's pain in a lot of cases. The bottom line is that there are too many parties involved, too many hands in the cookie jar, and too many social and or political dynamics and differing interests involved. Asking for any satisfactory resolution in this crisis is like asking for an end to war altogether. A nice thought, but highly unattainable. Any attempt to try to hold a pharmaceutical company solely responsible will only encourage drug companies to stay away from creating the treatment. Any attempt to try to limit the overprescribing of these opioids will dissuade doctors from wanting to see individuals in pain in the first place. Any attempt to question the individual about his or her true legitimate pain will foster trust mistrust issues between the individual and the entity doing the questioning, not to mention create an unhealthy and unwarranted stigmatization of the individual. Any attempt to limit the autonomy of the insurance companies will only lead to more lobbying and more back-end deals and further buyouts of politicians. In other words, this is nothing but an existential crisis for this country, and despite asking many questions about it, unfortunately the answers to it are harder to find than drugs off the street. We simply are all to blame for this epidemic. The crisis is that we frankly are stuck with no realistic resolution in our existential existence.
Alright, so a couple more stats here that I have uh, that I didn't include in my video. Uh, this is from the NIH National Institute on Drug Abuse. Uh, I mentioned this already before, more than 130 people in the U.S. die after OD and opioids. Uh, the CDC uh, estimates that the total economic burden of prescription opioid misuse alone in the United States is $78.5 billion a year. This includes the cost of healthcare productivity, lost productivity, addiction treatment, and criminal justice involvement. Uh, roughly 21 to 29 percent of patients prescribed opioids for chronic pain misuse them. Between 8 to 12 percent develop an opioid use disorder. An estimated 4 to 6 percent who misuse prescription opioids transition to heroin. And lastly, about 80 percent of people who use heroin first misuse prescription opioids. Wow, 80 percent who first who, who use heroin first misuse prescription opioids. Yeah. Look, just basically recap. Okay, so you've got four parties really that are involved in this game. You've got the patient, you've got the provider, you've got the pharmaceutical company, and you've got the insurance company. So really take out the patient out of the equation. They're not really the ones to blame here, okay? So what do you have left? Uh, provider, uh, insurance company, I'm sorry, uh, pharmaceutical company, and insurance company. Now the um, uh, pharmaceutical company, they're going to go ahead and do, uh, they're going to go ahead and manufacture the drugs. They're going to continue to churn it out. Uh, as long as there's not excessive lawsuits and, and, and whatnot, uh, as long as you know they're okay uh, in the green. So really take them out of the equation. Really the two main problems I see uh, out of the four are the uh, physician, the provider, and the um, uh, insurance company. Now these guys, the physicians, they're tied down by the insurance company. Uh, Here's an example. Anyone comes into your office, a doctor's office, with pain, whether it's back pain, whether it's neck pain, whatever, they're a lot of pain, chronic pain, right? Uh, so the provider has taken a Hippocratic oath to go ahead and do uh, least harm, to go ahead and try the uh, least invasive approaches for treatment. Uh, that includes, like, you know, massage, acupuncture, uh, maybe novel treatments, biofeedback, uh, maybe new medications that are non narcotics. Uh, that are addictive in nature, they may costly more. Uh, however, these insurance companies don't want to go ahead and pay for that. Uh, they'll pay maybe for a little bit, maybe for a couple of sessions of you know physical therapy, a couple of rounds. But no, they're not going to go ahead and approve for like a year. Uh, you know, these injuries may require a year of uh, physical therapy, may require uh, more excessive, you know, or can respond to alternative forms of treatment. However, they're costlier. So the insurance companies will go ahead, maybe in the beginning, approve of like the very, very basics, uh, a basic chest x-ray, a basic little uh, round of physical therapy here and there. But that's it. That's the extent. Anything more? No, because it costs a lot of money. Uh, there may be uh, some other drugs out there, some non-narcotics out there, alternative treatments that are more novel and newer and may go ahead and work um, just as well as the narcotics for pain. However, because they're so costly, insurance companies will go ahead and put hurdles for doctors. For example, require doctors to go ahead and fill out long lengthy forms, uh, form after form after form, uh, do what's called preauthorization, make phone calls. That, a lot of doctors don't want to go ahead and hassle with that, so they'll just go ahead and give up. And the easy route for them is to go ahead and prescribe the addictive Percocets and the hydrocodones and, and you know whatnot. So they're like techniques, and also these insurance companies will go ahead and um, have sort of criteria uh, in terms of reimbursement for these doctors, these pain doctors, providers to go ahead and meet certain standards and criteria uh, that are hard to attain to get sort of properly reimbursed. Um, in regards to uh, pain control, pain management, uh, and so on. So they have all these like you know hoops and hurdles uh, to where it limits their uh, total reimbursement dollar value. So yeah, um, in the end, these guys are the ones that are the winners for profiting because they're not paying out as much. Doctors are giving up. Doctors don't you know throw their hands in the air and. Uh, so yeah, in my opinion, these guys, the uh, insurance companies, are the ones to truly blame. They're the ones with the limitate that limit others, especially the physicians, from practicing how they want to practice. So until we go ahead and regulate uh, with stricter uh, regulations and restrictions on what they can do, uh, what they and what they should approve, uh, then yeah, uh, this will be a continual perpetual problem. 
Uh, unfortunately, the politicians uh, that promise folks that they're going to make changes, well, guess what? They're in bed with these guys, in addition to the pharmaceutical companies. So, in, in, in summary, it's a big mess. Uh, I don't see any end in sight to this crisis. I wish there were other answers. I wish there were other solutions, but unfortunately, I don't see any. Uh, do you guys see any? Uh, if you do, please uh, comment down below. Love to hear what you guys think about this video or uh, what sort of solutions you guys think uh, may be uh, viable here. Uh, anyways, thank you guys for watching, and please subscribe if you haven't, uh, and hit the like button, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks a lot.